Hello, folks. Welcome back to the Straightforward Farming Podcast. I'm your host, Tony Reed, alongside Nick McCormick. And harvest is getting underway here now. Uh, we've shucked, I don't know, not quite 200 acres of corn. How you guys get along? Uh, we just got started yesterday. Got a little bit of corn done, cut some beans today. So getting into it a little bit, and, and uh, it's good to be back. Yep. Yeah, I'm same same here. So far, pleasantly surprised with yeah. yields. Uh, yeah. I was I was kind of mixed all season long at first, you know, back in June. So I thought, you know, man, it's going to be really good yields. Yeah. Then as we got into August, I'm like, man, I don't really know that it's there. But now that the combines have rolled, I've been pleasantly surprised. Yeah. So, yeah. So far, so good. So, yeah. We're going to, we had two inches of rain here. So we're going to wait. Today's Friday. We're going to wait till Monday, uh, let things set for the weekend, and then uh, start out cutting beans on Monday. Be the first beans we've cut. So I'm anxious to get into them, you know, yeah. see what we got there. But, uh, so far, corn yields couldn't be happier. I mean, we're looking field yeah. averages of, I think the lowest I've been in was, well, there's one, there's 29 acres in the river bottom that we knew had severe water damage. Throw that out. It made 177 field average. But uh, outside of that, I've been in 215 up to 240 field averages. Yeah. So I'll take that all day long in a dirt yeah. farm. Yeah, can't beat that. I yeah. was pleasantly surprised on uh, the moisture. The wettest load of corn we had was 17.2. Yeah, I think so. some of this corn's a little bit drier than people think it yeah, is. Yeah, I think know. so. Now, that was the first field we planted, too. So, yeah, yeah. You know, it, it uh, stood the best chance, obviously, to be dry. But I think we got some more that'll be be, be ready to go as soon as we get back into it. So. Sure. We started out last spring. We planted a few beans first. Planted, I, I have to do the math. I don't, we're just, we'll say 150 acres. So that was like April 8th through the 12th or whatever, because there was a little bit of a rain delay there. Then we switched over and planted all the corn and then come back and finished up on beans. So we do have some early beans, which we've never done that before. Yeah. And then we've got what I would call normal planting time beans. So uh, yeah. I'm kind of curious. We did fungicide all the beans. Uh, Kevin planted all decalb corn this year, and he fungicided all his. I was all pioneer and didn't fungicide any. And we've only picked one field of decalb so far, and it was probably... 15-ish bushels better than any Pioneer that we've been in, but it is also some of our better ground that that decalb was on. Yeah. Um, so, I, I ain't got a good feel yet if the fungicide paid or not. I I can't think that it didn't, but I guess, I don't know. I got, I got to get a little farther into it here to see if it actually did. Yeah. Not, you know, so. We didn't do any corn. We did half our beans, so we'll have a pretty good comparison. Yeah. The beans we cut today weren't fungicided. We'll probably cut some tomorrow if it doesn't rain tonight that were. So yeah. Yep. We'll see, and, they, and they're the same number of beans, so we'll yeah. see. My personal opinion, I think you need to fungicide beans every year. I think I think you just do. I think it, around here, I've seen enough data, seen enough of my own personal stuff. I really think it pays. Corn, I, I just can't tell you if it does or not. It, you know, corn seems like it's one of those deals. There's some years you hit it big, and you're like, man, look at that windfall. we got to do that every year. Yeah. And then you give it back over the course of the next five, and then it hits again. Yeah. And back and forth. And like I so said, we just try to pick hybrids that supposedly don't need it. Sure. And uh We'll probably dabble a little bit in it next year. Yeah. But we, most of our stuff's got woods and this, that, and other around it, so they can't hardly do it with a plane. That's how we are. We got some of that. So it's so hard to get it done. That Yeah. Got a neighbor that plants a few thousand acres of corn. They left a 10-acre block in every field that they had fungicide on. And he said, thus far, with the field view and the John Deere yield monitor, all that, he said, I haven't seen a nickel's worth of difference really? in what was sprayed and what wasn't. So I can believe that. Yeah. Which, you know, they're they're the same way. I mean, granted, they probably picked more corn than anybody has in the area, but, you know, they've still got a long way to go. So something yeah. could show up on down the line here. But thus far, nothing's just jumped out and said, hey, man, it really paid for itself. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, guy can spend himself broke if you're not careful. That's just it. I mean, where do you draw the line? You know, you about was, nowadays, was writing checks. Yeah, you just gotta put a budget on it and this is what it is and yeah. And when it's gone, it's gone. I mean, but yeah. But I think on like last year we didn't do very many beans. I don't remember if we done any whole fields, but in several fields we sprayed strips crossways of what we yeah. planted them. And it was like hitting a brick wall with the combine. You'd be cutting along fine, then you get to them fungicide strips. I mean it would just it was just like really? hitting a brick wall, and it was literally 15 bushel the acre difference on them strips. That's what I heard, yeah. But that was the most we had ever seen. You know, normally it's a three, four, five bushel difference. Yeah. Maybe you just, just enough any. to get your money back but, yeah. and make you feel a little bit better about spending it. But, yeah. Yeah, so this year, the verdict's still out. We ain't cut any, so yeah. I don't know. But I'll, I'll know more tomorrow if it doesn't rain tonight. So Yeah, which they kind of snuck a rain in on us here at last yeah. week. Yeah, they did. But who knows? It could go away another that's just hours. it. I was talking to a buddy of mine in Western Illinois earlier tonight. He said it was starting to spit there. So really, yeah, yeah. yeah I ain't looked at any radar here, but 
Yeah, we don't need any. I mean, coming off a two-inch rain like that, and we weren't overly dry to start with, so... We were drier where we're at than you were. Yeah. And we didn't get as much. We only got, I don't know, probably an inch or less in, in places. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. So, that yeah, it makes a big difference. But Well, I had a little over an inch at my house, so... Oh, no kidding. Yeah, I had an inch and seven-tenths here, and we're two miles apart. So. Yeah, exactly. Wow. So, yeah, so we got a little less down there. So, we it was... Ground conditions were fine today. We weren't tracking or anything. Yeah. So... What are you thinking on? You do much fall in hydras? Or yeah. Do you? Yeah. I'm thinking if weather holds, I'm gonna try to put all mine on. Right or wrong, our supplier told us, you know, there's starting to be shortages now. Things are getting a little bit yeah. ugly, and he told us at the very least get some of it on because if the weather turns bad and they don't get none on, yeah, this could really get sideways in a hurry. So if I can get a good window, I mean, I, I don't see it being any cheaper by spring. I so don't either. You know, so what's there to gain? We always do some in the fall. we got certain farms we'll do, certain farms we won't do. Right. But, yeah, I'm going to try to get as much on as I can this fall, even if it's just partial rate. Yeah. And come back in the spring with, with something else if I have to. Yep. But, we'll do everything except the river bottoms, basically, you know, that flood, obviously. Yeah. But uh, I did hear tonight from a neighbor that – some new deals on crop insurance for the upcoming year is you will have a discounted rate if you split shot your nitrogen. Really? Yep. That's what he's hearing, which, man, does this open up the door for some fraud? Let's say I legitimately was planning on split shotting it yeah. so I get a discount on my insurance, but now it says in raining and I didn't get it on. Yeah. How do we handle this now? Yeah, you know, exactly. Who, who's going to verify that I did or didn't split shot it? Yeah. You know, it's pretty easy to make a phone call. Yep, going to split shot at all, but, well, the weather changed. I couldn't get it on, you know. So, split shot, if I do the whole field at 150, and then I go to lunch, and I come back and do that field again at 50, like two hours right. later, is that split exactly. shot? Exactly, right. Or? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> and now, granted, this is hearsay through the neighborhood. Um, I mean, this guy heard it from somebody who sells crop insurance. So, I mean, yeah. he would know, and he's never been a blowhard or one to lie. So, yeah. I would say it's it's probably something to it. But I, I haven't heard it from my agent personally, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. I'll have to look into that. So, and I don't know if there's any other kind of programs coming uh, there's, through. Well, there's always a program for a program for a program, it seems yeah. like. Yeah. I, I'm not opposed to split shot. Got a neighbor that does it. Looks like it works really well. I'm just always worried of not getting yeah. the second application. I, I'm not a fan of the urea. I've seen guys that have We've done that. We've tried that. We've gotten burned on that a few times, literally. Yeah. Um, burned on it. I, it has its place. I don't mind putting a little bit down. You know, we normally do fall fertilizer. If I'm going to do spring fertilizer, I don't mind putting a little down with it. Yeah. So it's got a little starter there to go with or something. But I know, this year, I wish I'd have pulled into one of these fields that I did last fall this spring. You know, with a partial rate, just to see, yeah, did I max out on my nitrogen? You know, is that my limiting right. factor? Right. I mean, I'm not complaining about the crops we've got so far, from what I've seen. Right. But you always want more. Right. You know, did I give something up there? Did I lose something with a wet winter, wet spring, wet right. summer? Uh, who knows? I think you know. the last probably three years, maybe four for sure, we've done just about all fall ammonia. Before, in the past, it was kind of hit and miss. We might do a little and kind of split it yeah. up, do some spring, some fall. But we've pretty well done it all the last three or four years. And really, it couldn't get any warmer or wetter than it has in the winters. No. And, you know, when we're pulling 240 bushel averages off fields, I mean, what more do you want? Down? I, mean, I mean, I can't tell you if we left any money on the table or not, but I'm extremely happy with those yields. You know, we tried it years ago. It it was a big gap. It did not work in the fall. And then we kind of dabbled back into it. And like I said, the last three or four years, it's been our best corn Yeah. every time. Now, it's usually on the better ground that we put fall anhydrous sure. on. But still, you think if you were, I mean, some of it's pretty close proximity. Yeah. You would think if you were giving something up there. Yeah. But I, I guess my point is I have a hard time believing that I'm picking field averages of 240 bushel. My neighbor's doing 260. Yeah. I'm not saying he's not because I don't know, but I yeah. I don't think that's the case. You know, the other thing about our soil is it goes on so much nicer in the fall. Yeah. So <clears throat> in the spring, you know, depending on the spring, you know, if you get that window in February or March where you can run some, that's great. But, you know, if it's into april and you got to get your gas on and you got to wait a little bit yeah and you put it on a little chunky anyway and then you got kind of a mess yep i don't know it delayed your planning you know right. everybody's plant early plant early plant early yep well are you giving up just as much as you're gaining there are you giving up right. planting date yield for the sake of nitrogen yield i mean yeah i don't know i i, mean, I agree uh, the only way any odds the only way i can ever get spring anhydrous to work right is i have to work the ground ahead of the applicator otherwise it don't seem like it seals right you're always seeing 
little poofs of smoke, which you know I know ain't much, but it's still there. Where in the it's fall you can just blow in, you don't ever see yeah, it. Yeah, you never yeah. see it. It just works good. Yeah, so I, I'm a fan of it, I guess, until I get burnt bad one of these days. Yeah, I, we got a couple different options and ways to put anhydrous on. You know, we've got an applicator, you know, a 19 knife bar, and I've also got the, my sulfur, you know, I series tool with, with anhydrous on it. So I can do it that way so I can save myself a trip in the fall by doing it with that, but it's slower than the bar. So it kind of depends on how big a window you've got on what I use. And I could do the same thing in the spring. So it just depends on what we think we ought to be doing on when we do it and how we do it. But yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. It goes on so much nicer with the, with the big bar yeah. speed wise. Yep. And, you know, and hydrous you're pulling a tank or whatever. Sometimes you can throw that wing out into a nook that I can't hardly get. Otherwise with a 30 foot tool, I can't hardly get it in there. You right. Know, yep. And get back out without having to, back up jimmy jack around right try to get back out of there you know it's not yep. we're not in flat square 80s yep so i'm in yeah 15 acre triangles yep yeah and we never run in serve in the fall and a lot no, of guys we do run in serve yeah that, i mean it's right what 12 bucks an acre now yeah probably and I, like once again i can't say we've ever been bit we don't run it not saying i'm right you or know, wrong you, you can we, make the argument that you just put that 12 dollars in more nitrogen yeah. and it's probably the same thing mm-hmm. you know now i we run in serve even in the spring a half rate in the spring up until a certain point, and then we'll do yeah. the last couple loads or whatever to get the bar and everything cleaned out. But, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll run a half rate in the spring. Yeah. We generally shoot for 180 pounds of actual in, and then yeah, because we, we don't figure any in out of your fall fertilizer because it's gone by then, you know. Yeah. But then we come back with, uh, now that we're in furrow on the planter, we're four, a little over four gallon of 1034 O. So we're getting a little bit of in there, but yeah. overall, you know, we're not putting down 230 pounds of actual in on anything yeah. like some guys, but, but also we don't have the soil that justifies that either. I don't think. I no. mean, we're talking I about, we don't. we're talking about maybe bumping these rates a little higher and seeing if we get some sort of a response, you know? Yeah. I mean, a guy can always play with it in small increments and, mm-hmm. and see where you land. Yeah. That's, and the, the bad part the is the beauty is, of farming. You, you try it one way and, your hindsight, you're like, man, I should have did all this or all that. Yep. And you never know. You so know? the next year you do it all, and then it didn't pay. <laughs> yeah, then it didn't work out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You should have did it a different way. <laughs> yeah. Now, it seems like you're always chasing your tail. I don't know. But where do you think the future of ag is going? I mean, this is getting. I don't know. It's getting it, crazy. It is. I mean, you know, you start seeing all these land sales in Iowa now, you know, twelve, fourteen, sixteen thousand dollars $16,000 an yeah, acre. Yeah, some of that. That real big one was a unique situation, though, wasn't it? It was. Yeah. I heard today that on the Effingham-Clay County line, which would be the next county south of Nick and I, and it's called Clay County for a reason, Yeah. <laughs> that one tract brought 12000 I think, and the other one brought fourteen, I think it was, or something, which for dirt down there is... That's high. <laughs> yeah, unless there's oil on it, that's. It seems like that's going to be a slow pay. But. Yeah, but you know, are we taking the next leg higher now? You know, when ground was at three, we're like, God oh, damn, you know how much higher is it going to go? And then it yeah. blew right to seven and eight without batting. You know, we yeah. didn't stop in the fours and five. It just went from three to seven. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And so now I don't know if we're just going to go from seven to fourteen. I, I don't know. I don't know. It. Uh, you know, you never. It, the, Frustrating part with ground is at the time it never pencils, right? Right. I mean, you're only the only way you can make it pen, if it penciled, you'd take every acre you could buy. Exactly. My buddy and I have talked about this all the time. He's like, you show me ground that pencils for, pencils itself the day you bought it. He's like, I'll buy every acre you can find me. Yeah. Why wouldn't you? Yeah. He's like, yeah, I'd be a fool not to. He's like, any banker loan you money on ground that pencils for the first year. Yeah. You know, but I don't know you're just playing the long game and playing it for your kids. Etc. You know, it's like Yellowstone says. It's, you know, it's the only uh, business you try to be in where the goal is just to survive till next year. Right. You know, but it's I, one hell of a life. I think it would be neat. I'd have to ask my dad. I don't know if he would even know or remember. You know, let's say in the 1960s. You know, if you could have bought a nice 80 around here, and let's just throw out four or five hundred bucks an acre. I, that's probably about what it'd have been worth back then. I mean, a lot of it in the 60s. I mean, yeah, probably. And I've been curious to know what was the payoff on that. You know, could you pay that off in 10 years farming it? I, I don't know. I don't have any idea. I mean, but them guys always seem to buy 160 acres every about 10 years. You know, a lot of the guys that yeah. started farming back then and buying was, you know, back yeah. then it was all big chunks that hadn't been all busted up yet. Yeah. And so I'd be curious to know what the payback was on land. Yeah. I, yeah, you're probably not wrong there. But, I mean, I, mean, I remember back in the 80s, there's a piece that sold not too far from our home farm, and I talked to a guy that had a chance to buy it. And he didn't farm. He had another business and had recently bought a farm, basically for the woods at the time. 
piece of equipment, you know, it was, what was it, like 85000 you could buy this farm for or something like that. He's like, but corn was like 83 cents. Right. And, you know, it just it didn't pencil then. Yeah. Now, granted, it was the 80s, you know, so the 60s yeah. probably would have been a better time for that than, than the 80s. But it's just crazy to think that back then, for what a pickup truck costs now, you could buy a farm. Yeah, that's just unbelievable. Now yeah. it's what the down payment would be. Yeah. And uh, you still got a long ways to go. Yeah. Yeah, if you look at the gap that you and I have seen, which I guess if land keeps climbing like it is when you throw out these Iowa numbers, I guess our kids are going to see it too. But, you know, we literally seen land in the 80s. And, I mean, you know, we were six, seven years old, so not like we were paying yeah. major attention to this. Yeah, but exactly. technically in our lifetime, you know, land has went from probably, what, a low of around 1000 bucks an acre in the 80s once stuff yeah. got real crazy with yeah. interest to, you know, there's been land around here sell for twelve or 14000 yeah. an acre. You know, so in less than forty years, it went from a thousand to twelve thousand. Yeah, and so is that the next leg? You know, is it going to go from twelve to twenty-four? And I mean, but at some point in time, you can't farm that out of it, regardless. Yeah. I mean, it's bad enough when it's three thousand an acre. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know where that where that's going to land. You know, buddy and I talk about this all the time. You know, he's like, my grandpa could buy ground. You know, back in the day, you know, and uh, you know, you could you could graduate high school and your family might have farmed, but. You went out on your own. You you picked up a little ground. You know the neighbor down the street said, "Hey, you know, farm my ground." You start farming on your own a little bit. You could buy some. You could end up owning yep. three, four, or five hundred sure. acres at the end of your lifetime, and you started with zero. Yeah, that's nearly impossible to do now right. without some tomfoolery. Yeah, you know, or absolutely. some really, really, really good luck. Right, and funding it from three other side businesses right. and good and, and I don't mean to beat a dead horse because I know we talk about a lot of this stuff a lot of time in this podcast, but even in the 60s, a, a lot of the guys, not all, but a lot of them had newer equipment, mm-hmm. you know, a 560, uh, yeah, 806, you know. Well, they had to have new stuff prior to that. It was horses. Yeah, you exactly. Know, so, there, I mean, there wasn't an old stuff to pull from. The right. old stuff. Yeah, you didn't go out and say, well, I'm looking for an 806 with 5,000 hours. Well, the fucking thing's leaving out three years. <laughs> yeah. You're not going to find one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's what, you know, everybody always laughs. Well, that guy bought a brand new tractor and took a tractor pulling. Where was he going to get a used one at? Right. <laughs> they only been out for a year. Yeah. I mean, there, there wasn't any, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, I, But it, it was funny because nowadays, literally, you know, it's different, I guess, once you're 70 years old and established and have stuff paid for. But for guys like you and I, you're either going to buy land or machinery. You're not going to yeah, buy both. You're not going to buy both. But back then, you could. You could buy yeah. a little bit of land with a new tractor or new combine, whatever, you know, and you kind of clawed your way through it, and it all worked out. But but you could also have a side job that made your down payment on your next farm yeah. pretty easily. Right. You know. Yeah. Well, Give you know, some money to live on. You know, you could have a good factory job in Effingham and working it, you know, yep. world color or whatever. Yep. And that would, you know, your overtime, basically, you could take keep your normal wage. And whatever you, if you were ambitious and willing to work the overtime, your overtime money would be the down yeah. payment for your next farm. And you yeah. can buy a farm every two or three years yeah. just we, based off of that. We yeah. know guys that have done that. Yeah, we got a neighbor that started literally with nothing. Yeah. And he always said, you know, every seven years working at the factory, I could pay for a farm. Yeah. Buy 80 acres, have it paid for in seven years and just yeah. keep doing that. Just keep doing that. But now that's not the case. You know, you're yeah. not going to go make a million dollars a year working at the factory. <laughs> <laughs> no. If you find one of those, you let me know. Yeah. I'll cover some shifts for you. <laughs> yeah. So... That yeah, it's just definitely changed. But yeah. I, I would like to know though back then how long it actually took. Let's just you know throw out the side job, whatever. You know, if I was just farming and I bought a hundred and sixty acres at four hundred bucks an acre, because I don't know what inputs were. I don't even how how many inputs you used back then. You know, anhydrous didn't catch on till the late sixties, I think. You know, there was a lot of stuff that they yeah. weren't doing then that we're doing now. Yeah, and, they weren't spending some money on some other stuff. It was just I'll never forget the first time. I was kind of sort of paying attention to a seed corn guy coming to the shop. And that's when seed corn just got to a hundred dollars a bag. And this guy was trying to sell my dad on some seed. And I don't even know what he ended up agreeing to buying, whatever it doesn't matter. But the guy left. I told dad, I said, is that, did I hear that right? That, that seed corn's a hundred dollars a bag. And he's like, yeah. I'm like, then why do we sell it for like yeah, a dollar or something at the elevator? He's like, welcome to farming. Exactly. <laughs> I'm like, okay. You know, of course I didn't know the Right. You know, I wasn't very old at the time. You know, it's like, okay, you know, you get 150 bushel right. the one way, and you're only buying. But I'm like, now I understand why you want every kernel out of the damn bag. You want me to shake it three times, yeah. you know, for before sure. I chuck the bag, because it's, sure. it's expensive. Hell, remember yeah. when he was kids, that's what they gave away at tractor pulls. So when you yeah. got first place, yeah, free bag of seed corn. The seed corn got too high, they quit doing yeah, that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. They haven't given you a bag of seed corn to pull for 20 years <laughs> yeah. now, you know. Win the antique class, get a $500 prize. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, I can't, uh, can't do that anymore. I don't know. It uh, It's crazy out there. But, I mean... 
and the technology keeps ramping up, which is to me the ripoff is in soybeans because that is literally sell them at the elevator for ten bucks and turn around and buy them for forty bucks. Literally, you yeah. ran them through a cleaner, and that's all you did. And they, yeah, and they really, you know, all those tech fees and this, that, and the other that they used to charge for now they're just built into the price of it. Yeah, but that's such bullshit because they don't pay those in any other country. You go to South America, yeah. you can buy Asgro soybeans down there. They're not charging yep. them a tech fee. Yep. When Roundup was forty dollars a gallon here, it was like four dollars a gallon there. Yep. Genuine Roundup. The American farmer gets hit with all yeah. that, you know. Kevin's like, Kevin said this for years. You know, he said I could raise night or I could raise fifty bushel beans in nineteen eighty. Mm-hmm. But every year when the seed corn salesman comes, oh, these are two bushel butter, two bushel butter. It's yeah. like why well, ought to have one hundred fifty bushel soybeans by now? And I don't yeah. have them. So what's going on? <laughs> well, I always equate that to, yeah, I bought this Mustang GT and I got my Jegs catalog out and I bought the fifteen horse exhaust and I bought a twenty horse programmer. <laughs> Next thing you know, I'm hunting John Force down. Right. You know, <laughs> I bought all these fifteen horse add ons. Pretty soon I got seven hundred horse and I am hunting somebody down. We're going to drag race, you know. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah. <laughs> It, it uh, is a little bit of a crock of shit. You know, nothing's really kept up wage-wise when you think, you know, back, a pickup truck was $10,000 not that long ago. Yeah. You know, at the same time, we're talking about buying these farms for, not for cash, but being right. able to cash flow them and, and inputs being cheaper and this, that, and the other. It's like, for what a pickup truck costs now, wouldn't you have to make proportionally? I'd have to do the math on it, but you'd have to make a hell of a lot more than most people we know make. Oh, yeah. You know, be, yeah, on God. Yeah. So, yeah. It's just, but to me, isn't isn't the bank only betting on the come? Like if you're playing craps at a casino, because the only reason they're willing to loan you this money is because the ground is worth ten thousand a day, and they know it's going to be worth fifteen in the future. Because it damn sure ain't on cash flow. There ain't no way. No, but I guess if they get enough down, if they get enough down payment on it. They're banking on it. If you lose it. They can, you you've yeah. paid enough on it. They're going to come out good on it. And let's face it, banks like to own ground too. Oh yeah, so, for sure. If somebody loses some in there, but yep. but they put enough on it, and they ain't got a lot in it. Right. Then they're getting it bought for right. five or six. Well, you show me a bank that wouldn't buy ground for five or six right now. Yeah. You know, they buy a lot. So I guess I look at it as sort of like the subprime mortgage crisis in 07 or 08, you know, that, and that's what screwed everybody yeah. that you, you bought a house today in Florida. You never even seen it. You don't care. Yeah. You're not going to live there, but you can buy it for a hundred grand today and sell it for 200 tomorrow. Yeah. And the banks loaned all this money and until it collapsed. Yeah. Until it collapsed. And then everybody got left holding and, the bank. And the bank's kind of. Backed up here fairly recently to where you had to have a lot down oh, yeah. or they wouldn't loan over a certain amount. Right. And this, that, and the other. And, and then they're getting a little looser with it again now, I think. Right. But, uh, Which is even worse to me on 80 acres at $10,000 an acre. Yeah. Not, not going to have 40% down. Well, who the hell's got that? I don't at my <laughs> yeah. age. You know? I hear you. I mean, you're going to be hard-pressed to find a lot of 70-year-old men that do it. That. I mean, yeah, that, that's the thing. That's a chunk. The only way you can roll that is once you get something paid for, you know, you can leverage it, but then that's risky, too. Yeah. I you mean, know? why jeopardize what you've already got bought and paid for? Yeah. That, that, that bit a lot of guys in the 80s. They yeah. were rolling that way in the 70s, and next thing you know, they were selling stuff they, they'd paid for once. Yeah. I'll so. never forget, uh, somebody on Ag Talk posted, and this has probably been seven, eight years ago, and... Uh, it was PBS out of Iowa done a documentary basically on the 80s farm yeah. crisis. And I'll never forget they had this farmer. And it was a really good documentary. I can't remember the name of it now. But Harry Smith, I remember him from the Today Show years and years yeah. ago, was a journalist who'd done it. But they was interviewing all these farmers. And there was a guy on there. I'll never forget it. He said uh, he was rolling along there. And this was in probably 84, 85. And he had, I don't remember if he said he had like 600 acres that was his. It was bought and paid for. And he was running some cattle and, you know, just working himself to death, you know. And the banker come over and said, hey, man, there's 160 acres coming up for sale a mile down the road. He said, I think you ought to buy it. And the guy looked at him. He said, well, why would I want to buy it? And he said, well, he said, I think you're going to get it bought right. You know, you really ought to look into that. And the guy said, I can't handle what I got now. Why would I want more? And he said, looking back now, he said, it was the best thing I ever done by not buying that because he said, I would have had to leverage most of what I had paid for to do that. And he said, yeah. I would have lost it all yeah. once we seen what interest done from there on out, you know. And so it's one of them deals where... You know, any you know, because we always look back at the eighties at how hard it was. Well, it wasn't hard for the guys who weren't leveraged to the max. I mean, if you had money in the bank, it was collecting twenty percent interest because yeah. you weren't leveraged to the hill. You were doing good. Yeah, you know, yeah, your interest check paid your living expenses. Yeah, so yeah, it, it kind of gets a black eye just for the people who were over leveraged. You know, yeah. we always forget about the other side of that equation. But that was the guy's point, you know. He's like, it would have probably bankrupted me yeah. had I listened to my banker, and it, he kind of felt that he'd done him a disservice by coming out trying to push him into buying that. You know, and, and there's always some factors that play into that that are always make me, you know, like just analyze it a little bit more. Like, Dad had a friend back in the 70s that was 
that was, you know, rolling, I won't say big, but, you know, they bought some stuff machinery-wise, ground-wise, was doing good. You know, 80 started to come on, got a little tight. He'd overspend a little bit, a little over-leveraged. He could have sold one piece, been free and clear, been good to go. But FHA or whatever it was at the yep. time said, no, you can't sell that. So, you know, a couple year, more years go by, and they forced him to sell it for way yeah. less than, than what he could have sold it for initially. Yeah. His ground was tanking. And interest had ate up so much stuff, it didn't cover his other stuff. Yeah. And he still ended up going under. Like, if they just let him get out of that one piece. Yeah, he'd have been fine. He'd have been fine. Yep. He'd have, he'd have farmed the rest of his life. Right. You know, because it, it turned around not too long after that, but yep. by then it was it didn't matter. Yep. You know. Yeah, it makes you wonder how that all, because I was too young to remember any of that. I mean, I was born in 1980, but you're not paying attention to that shit when you're seven years old. You, you know, know, the only reason I, of course, Dad tells the stories, and then, you know what, from being at the dealership, with trying to sell tractors to guys or, you know, hearing this, that, and the other, I picked up a little bit more than probably the average person, but I wasn't paying attention to right. it. Right. But you hear, this, you hear the stories at the time. They don't mean anything to you. But later on, you start putting the pieces together a little bit. You know? Right. But. Yeah, it makes you wonder if some of them bankers really felt that they were doing the right thing, like on a deal like that where they said yeah, don't probably. sell it. I mean. Or was it one of them deals where they just didn't know and it's like, well, you know. But, well, I think the FHA had weird rules, you know, and I don't think they – they could let him do it, you know, for whatever reason. I'd have to ask Dad the specifics of it if yeah. he even remembers, you know. But, but yeah, it uh, it's yeah. a it, it can turn into a mess pretty quick. I mean, I can't imagine. Could you imagine today on which I know stuff is always proportionate with inflation, whatever. But could you imagine eighty acres, fourteen thousand dollars an acre, and interest went to twenty percent? I mean, mm. I, I can't fathom how you would ever dig out of that. I mean, with the inputs we've got today, cost wise, I mean, you're swapping if, humongous numbers now. If interest goes that high, I think there's a ton of people that can't afford to put a crop out. Oh, I think so too. And probably, not, probably myself. Yeah, included. Say, I'm not saying that I'm unique in that. I, <laughs> yeah. I think I'm probably falling that category. But you know, you start figuring up what that adds to your costs for sure. You know, because there's a ton of people that borrow a ton of money for inputs. Once again, myself included, that. That I don't know that that works if interest is 17, 18, right. 19, 20 percent, you know. Right. And once again, it comes back to the younger guys like you and I that ain't established that have to borrow the money. Mm-hmm. You know, we're borrowing three times more money to put a crop out than what our dads were borrowing to buy farms. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. Yeah. What and, the average 500 acre farmer borrows now would have bought him a farm easily. Yeah. Back then. For sure. Yeah. And so that's what gets scary when you're trading large volumes of money like yes. you are now. It's like, man, one uh, ripple on the pond. Like we've always said, seven, eight dollar corn was the worst thing they were having to farm. It was, probably. you know, we were way better off four or five, yep. making okay money. Yep. The stuff didn't get stupid. Nobody got their their you know their knife out and really started gouging. Right. You know. And how do you position yourself moving forward? Because yields are obviously trending higher, and you know people might argue that, but they definitely are on our farm. I mean, yeah. they, they truthfully are. Which, to me, should equate to lower prices because... But there's less ground farmed every year. True. That's where we always get a chuckle. We found all these acres. Found, where? Because every place I go, they're building on something. Right. You know? Oh, yeah. You go to aren't going up. They're yeah. going out. If you go to Champaign, Illinois now, from just the time that I graduated high school, yes. 22 years ago or whatever it's been, yeah. it is ungodly along the interstate. When I was in college, none of that stuff was on the west side of the interstate, and the stuff on the east side of the interstate did not touch the interstate. Yeah. Now they've jumped it and built a bunch of stuff on the west. Yeah. None of that was there. Yeah, and that's one city. It, one city in nowhere, our, Illinois. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's ungodly, but I don't know. I, I don't know what the future holds. You know, we're going to see a major shift eventually. I mean, there's no way around it as far as – look look at it now. Any place you go to. I, so was looking – doing some tractor shopping the other day. Went to th- three different John Deere stores. Every single one of them had help wanted sign on the door, yeah. which ain't uncommon right now. No. But right now, we can't get nobody to work on the stuff we got. Yep. How's this going to change once we transition to electric farm equipment? Because it's coming. I don't care if anybody wants to admit that or not. It's coming. I mean, they're shoving it down your throat, and it's coming. So how are we going to transition? You know, there's got to be a big transition here of where people switch. Yeah, it's going to be a mess. And I think there's going to come a term... A turn there, whereas if that group of people sticks together a little bit, that'll be a very lucrative profession to be in. 
I would agree. Um, because you're going to run out of people that can do it. Like a buddy of mine said for several years now, he's like, you know, I don't know why these service trucks don't have two guys in them. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, you need one guy that can actually do the work that's 50 plus that actually knows how to run valves, et cetera, et cetera. He's like, then you got to have a kid that's under 20 that can run the, the, the computer. Yeah. Can run the technology to figure out what, you know, what's wrong, mm-hmm. but he can't do any of the work. Doesn't want to do any of the work. He wants to run the laptop. And he's saying it kind of jokingly or whatever, but by the same token, it's true, right? It's not too far off. It's not too far off. So as this progresses, that's just going to get worse because the 50-year-old guys are 70, and they're they're quitting. Yep. Well, unless they're farming, then they keep doing it forever. But (laughs) And then the younger guys still don't want to do it. They still want to sit on the laptop, and they're they're getting outpaced in the technology range. So you got to have even younger guys to do that, and right now nobody wants to do anything. Right. So who's going to learn all this stuff? Yep. And how are you going to teach them? And once they do learn it, what's, what's, how can you pay them enough to keep them there? Yeah. You know, we're, I mean, we're even seeing that now for us, it was literally a no brainer to run John Deere equipment. I, I, you know, as well as I do, I'm not a diehard John Deere guy. I grew up on red stuff my whole life, but we're four miles from a very yeah. good dealership. Yep. And the flip side of that with the IH went through some pretty tough times and wasn't the best. I'm not saying that's the case now, but a few years or several years ago was kind of a Mickey Mouse operation, but it's getting to the point now where it's like, I don't know if you're gaining anything because they're down to three mechanics in the shop when yeah. they would normally have 10, 12, whatever. They get all these kids that come in out of college. They work there for three months, and then they go to the truck repair shops in Effingham along the interstate mm-hmm. and make better money. Yep. And then they can't keep no help. And it, now all you got is guys throwing parts of stuff. They don't want to diagnose anything. And to me, it's, it's very rapidly dwindling the advantage to run John Deere equipment on our farm because... I, if I want Mickey Mouse service, I can go to anywhere else and get it too. So what's the advantage well, of running deer now? The part of the kicker is on the ag side of thing is like okay, you know in the truck truck world, like that's pretty steady. Like right. trucks break down every time, or you know all the time. There's no huge busy season. Some a little more than others, right. but you know in the ag world, it's harvest season. Saturdays aren't yours anymore. Saturdays are. The dealers, the customers, whoever, for the most part, you know. So you got to find somebody that's willing to put all that extra time in. Well, when, and most they can go to get most trucking truck companies place. have a fleet of twenty trucks. It's they like just this, put it, they this put one goes down, one. Yeah. jump in the other one. Yeah, you don't have that. Uh, we don't have that luxury with yeah. the combine or no. your big tractor or exactly. planter or whatever, you know. So we're a little unique that way, I, you know. And then you got the whole argument on the multi stores versus the single stores, etc. You know, you know the one thing that the multi stores used to be able to offer was okay. They can justify a really, really, really good technology guy, and they'll share here in between two or three stores, right? And they might they probably got another guy below him, maybe a guy below that, but they got one guy that mm-hmm. that knows it backwards, forward, and sideways. Yep. Okay. Well, that guy left or quit or whatever, and now they can't find anybody to replace him. Now they've lost that advantage to mm-hmm. some degree. Whereas a single store guy might have been a loyal guy and, and probably still there, right? But he's not as good of an expert because he doesn't see as many cases of this, that, or whatever when it comes to technology. And it, the technology stuff is changing so fast. How do you get somebody that's super, super, super good at that? We're you fortunate can. if you're not using Deer Case, if you're using off brand stuff, and not, it's not off brand, but let's say you're just using Trimble Raven, whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, we've got a phenomenal Trimble guy in our area. Mm-hmm. You know. But he's a one man guy. But that's the reason he's a one man guy. Why does he want to train his competition going forward? Because yep. if he hires somebody, that guy's going to leave, start his own business in two years. Exactly. So, but he knows his stuff backwards, forwards, and sideways. But we're running out of those guys. And how do you? Yeah. It, it changes so fast that I don't know that you can train them fast enough, right? To keep up with it, you know, it's it's very difficult. I was thinking about technology, stupid stuff tonight. Stop and fill my wife's car up with gas. Remember the days where you could just flip the pump on and pump your gas. Nope. Now you got to prepay it to pump because God dang, somebody's going to drive off. Okay, I'll prepay because I don't want to go in anyway. Mm-hmm. Oh, do you want a car wash? No, I'm in a freaking gas pump. Exactly. I want gas. Exactly. Oh, do you want to watch TV? The TV kicks on. Where no, I don't want to watch TV. It, you've wasted four minutes of my time, and there hasn't been any gas come out of this damn pump yet. Yeah. I just want to flip the switch and pump the gas. I you know. I, technology, I'm like, in some ways, is great, but it hasn't helped my. It slowed me down at some level. I'm like, yeah. I, my tank has been full. I've been back on the road by now in the old yeah. days. You yeah, know. you're right. Or somebody to come out and pump my gas for me, and I sat there, and he'd have got a job, yeah. and I'd have sat there in my car the whole time. Right. But, no. 
No, you. It, I know what you're saying. It's, it's aggravating. You know, technology is a double edged sword on that. It's it's so frustrating. It's like, you know, you think about your cell phone. That's how much just do everything but make a call now. Yeah. But it's like, how much time am I wasting on that thing that I used to have for me? Yep. That now I'm spending doing whatever on it. You know, I, yeah. I can do a lot of things on it, which is great. But yep. I'm never actually away from work either. Right. You know, email, text, right, TikTok. Facebook, yeah. how much something? How many you know? constructive things are you doing on? Yeah, because there's a lot of bulls, and I'm as guilty as anybody. anybody. Yeah, I'm not saying I'm unique yeah. that I'm that I'm not doing any of that because I am. But you know, it's I don't know. At some level, I do long for the days where I could just pull a throttle, smoke went out the pipe. Yep. I hit a lever, something went up and down. No phone bothered. And it was you. loud enough; nobody could call me if I had one. Exactly. You know. <laughs> yeah. But we're past that now, at least for the short term. We might get back to that the way things are looking, but yeah, you know, farming has it's just it's went off the rails. I mean, I hate to say that. I, I like the new technology. I really do. I, I love all that stuff. It's great. It's handy. Yeah, but man, I, I think we've talked about this before in a podcast. It makes you wonder if a class five or six combine should have been the biggest combine anybody ever made. Yeah, and for sure. And I'm not knocking big farmers. I don't want anybody that farms several thousand acres listen to this because I'm not. I'm. No, I get why they want the big machines and helps hard to find. When we just said you can't find anything to work on it. Damn. I think we're under attack. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you know, so I don't know. It uh, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and more and more out of control. And I'm not sure. You know, you and I probably can't do anything to stop it. It just is what it is. But yeah, it, it's I don't know. I don't know how you fix it, how you unwind it, because it's obvious when a combine costs a half a million dollars or a million now with oh, a new yeah. X nine, you got to spread that over more acres. Yeah. You know? So I mean, you just want to see a mad guy have his million dollar combine go down, nobody to fix it. Yeah, like he's not going to be very happy about that, and I don't blame him. Yeah, you know, but at the end of the day, if he's got a million dollar combine, he probably ain't got a spare. Exactly. You know? He's probably not going to hop out of that, fire up the old sixty six twenty. And and get after it, so he's right. still getting something done. You right. know, no, he's on the phone, yelling at somebody. Yeah, if there's anybody there to pick up the call to answer. You yeah, know? yeah, that's so, the next problem. Yeah. I don't know. We got to get this country back to work somehow, some way. Well, and you know, I've read that report too. That because I don't know about you, but I can't. I don't know of anybody who's worth their salt that don't have a job. You've always got the deadbeats that have never had a job yeah. and never going to have a job. Yeah, but anybody that's always had a job, everybody I know has a job. And they talked about when COVID hit, you know, the baby boomers are like, fuck it, I'm out. Yeah. You know, the, say you got a guy that was 62 years old driving a truck and COVID hits. He's still an essential worker, so he can drive. But when he gets to the truck stop, all he can do is get fuel. He can't yeah. go in and take a shower, get a hot meal, whatever. Yeah. After a couple of weeks of that, he's like, I'm, screw this, I'm done. Yeah, and he I'm just done. retires. So now you take all these baby boomers offline and nobody else to step up to fill yeah. their shoes. So I don't know how you fix this moving forward because now you know you got local trucking companies around here willing to pay people 25 30 dollars an hour for just a day driver not an over-the-road driver you know i've thought for a while throughout this i'm like now would be a magical time to be getting out of high school oh for sure i'm like your chances you know like you want to go to fedex for a part-time job you start at the max wage yeah a wage that it took other guys three four five years to get to you could start there tomorrow yeah you can pass the drug work all you want and work all you want yeah, it'll be a full-time job if you're not careful, you know, and several other companies the same way. Like, you can do about anything you want, you know. It's like, yep. you pull into a fast food restaurant, you're just hoping if the speaker kicks on. Yeah. You know, otherwise, yeah. you know, there might be somebody in there, he's just there to fuck, shut the lights off. Yeah. You know, that, you know, it's it's a mess all the way around. I really do think this is where, especially like in fast food, and I said this a long time ago before COVID ever even hit, Eventually, McDonald's, you don't have enough people going in McDonald's to justify staying open. You don't. I mean, the local one we go to, the cars are literally wrapped all the way around the building at noon. Nobody wants yeah. to go inside. And I'm like, now you're going to, the next time you see a McDonald's in this area remodeled, they're probably going to knock off the dining area because you don't need it. Everybody wants to go to the drive-up. You got three guys that are drinking a 95-cent coffee yeah. that you made zero money on. You're not wrong. It's going to go the way of the playground. Yeah. You know, for a while, we yeah. had a playground to get you inside. Well, yep. then we realized nobody was going to the playground, so we nipped them off for other space. And, yep. And you're not wrong. I mean, some of those businesses, you know, like we've got a local place here that's a double drive through and has been, that was their, that was their go-to yep. 25, 30 years ago. 
And then for 20 years, we said, well, if they just had a lobby, if you just had a place where yeah. you could sit down, now it's like, oh, well, they don't need that now. Yeah, now they're, they're killing their time. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're ahead of their time and they're killing it, you know. And, uh, they don't have to clean the lobby and nobody's going in anyway. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's a mess. Oh, you know, we were talking to here a while back and even heard it from one of our marketing guys. You know, let's just throw out the whole climate change deal. I don't care if you believe in it or don't. It's on us, and we're going to get forced into it regardless. It's coming because the Farm Bureau, none of these groups want to do anything to combat any of it. They just yeah. go along to get along. And so it's here, and that's going to majorly change the landscape of how things are done in America from farming to everything. Yeah. And, you know, I, and I would like to talk to somebody in depth that actually knows, you know, not fake news or just people's opinions. So, like, their big thing is we got to start conserving water. Okay, so how does that affect guys like – you and I, because all we're counting on is rain anyway. Yeah, I, I, I can't, I can't ask for more. I can't take less. I mean, I yeah. get what I get. Get what I get. Yeah. So, you know, how are you going to do a one size fits all? I, I, I understand. I guess if you're irrigating, that they can control that. Well, Tony, they'll do it the way the government always does it. They'll throw down some general rule that doesn't really fit anybody, and yeah. they'll screw a bunch of us, yeah. and then it'll just go on. Right. And then a few years later, they will say, "Oh, we, we got to rechange this program. We didn't do that right." And then yeah. they'll screw it up even worse the next go yeah. around. No, that's you're right. That's, goes. It's exactly how it goes. But those guys at Irrigate, if they start shutting them off, I and mean, there's places, well, we got one in Illinois. You shut them off from irrigation, they literally can grow nothing. Right. Nothing. I mean, that, right. that ground's wasteland at that point. Yeah. You know. And is this the, I, I don't mean this to be a conspiracy, whatever, but is this is this all going to fall into the fact, okay, we knock ethanol offline because we're going electric, so we don't need 93 million acres of corn. Yeah. So all you guys are irrigating, you're done. Fuck it. So now the guys like you and I that weren't irrigating to begin with are like, well, you guys can go ahead and grow corn because we still need X amount for feed or whatever. So I would be, I I guess I'm more comfortable living and farming where I do versus what we would call the fringe. You know, when we were kids, you didn't grow corn in North Dakota. You just didn't. Now they do. But if I was in them areas, I would be very seriously looking long-term at different options yeah. Or, or wherever they irrigate. I guess North Dakota don't have to be that. Cause I don't know if they irrigate much up there. But, you know, western Nebraska yeah, or Colorado. I know what you're saying. You yeah. know. Place where there's water rights and it's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I I don't know. That, I mean, they're pushing us towards we don't need any of that, Tony. You got fake meat. Yeah. You don't, you, so you won't need any of that. We need, yeah. What we need is ethanol power plants, apparently, because we're taking all the coal ones offline, which is a genius move. Oh, maybe. yeah. That's going to work out great. Yep. We'll have some nice blackouts out of that when yeah. the sun doesn't shine, the wind doesn't blow. I mean, we're only the Saudi Arabia of coal. I yeah, mean, we wouldn't we... want to use any of that yeah. for anything. I mean, the Nazis could make diesel fuel out of it in the 40s, but nah, we don't want to go down that path. Well, we'll just sit here in the dark and, and hope the wind turns on tomorrow. Yeah. Seems like a great plan. Yeah, solar works really good at night. Doesn't take up any ground, doesn't have any rare earth minerals getting mined to make any of that shit. Can't make any of it in the U.S. anyway. That's a great plan. Yeah. You know, you and I talked about this here a while back. You know, you get people on the other side that always say, well, yeah, but, you know, we need to trade with other people and we'll just rape all their minerals while we keep ours. And then, you know, we ain't got to worry about it and then we'll have the upper hand. But it never works that way. No. Because the way I see it. When okay, was the last time we ran somebody out of something? That's what I mean. Let, let's just pretend now no. that, that we pumped the Middle East dr- totally dry of oil. Yeah. Okay. So now we have way less oil on the planet than what we had before, right? Because we pumped the Middle East dry. Yeah. So that's going to make our oil way more valuable, right? Yep. So it's going to get so unaffordable that people are going to look for alternatives now because yeah. it's like we have less of it. So so it never that sounds good on paper. It sounds good in theory, but it don't work that way. It, the only way you can make that work is to take those countries over. You don't, exactly. you don't barter with them. You take them over, exactly. and then it's yours. Right. That's the right way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. terrible to say, but it's true. No, but it's true. You know, I mean. Because like you said, when was the last time we ran somebody clear out of something? Yeah. Because to me, once it gets more scarce, it becomes more valuable to yeah. where it becomes unaffordable. So you're like, well, fuck this. We're going to find some other way to do it. Yeah. So you do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I don't know. But man, the landscape is sure changing. I, I don't know what I would tell us a kid my age, you know, 12 years old that likes to farm. I don't know if I could recommend it or not. I, I'm not saying he can't do it. It's a but, great It's a great lifestyle. Man, the the stress of it's getting to be more and more every day, and I I just don't. There's easier. If you're looking for an easier path, there definitely are easier paths. Oh yeah, you know that take way less capital investments. Like you know, people nag on farmers. Well, you know, you got you guys got this new truck or this new combine. Yeah, okay. And by the same token, you find me another job that requires. In this day and age, you don't have to have a four year education, but it doesn't hurt for some 
for some things. Okay, that's fairly expensive. And takes, okay, you want to farm 1,000 acres so you can be somewhat a full-time farmer. Mm-hmm. Okay, how many millions of dollars is that ground worth? Right. So you got to have that, whether you're renting it or buying it. Somebody owns it. You, it's tied into the operation right. somehow. You need a couple million dollars worth of equipment. Mm-hmm. You know, I always joked when I was a kid, you send somebody to the farm progress show, the farm machinery show with a million dollars, you couldn't come home with enough stuff to farm. Well, that's not even... I mean, that, that's yeah. not even a funny joke at this point in time. You, you wouldn't come home with two pieces, hardly. Yeah, exactly. You know? and a so, you, so you find a guy that, that's got a good factory job or whatever. I'm not saying factory life's easy because there's negatives to go to for the haters get on here. But I'm like, he's got some sort of vehicle to get him there or public transportation tied up in that, and that's it. Mm-hmm. You know, he didn't have to tie up right. $2 million for the machinery to try to make that 50, 60, 100 grand, whatever, yeah. whatever number yeah. we're shooting for salary wise. Right. And he doesn't have the, the variability of, well, this year you might make 30. Next year you might make 130. Right. Year after that, now they might be selling you out because you made 10. Right. You know, things and went bad part, and you didn't make shit. The part that the people on TikTok or the social media never see is you got to play the tax game. Okay, yeah. so this year I had a great year. I made 100 grand, which you're over 150. Pick your number, which yeah. is, you know, more than the average guy. But guess what? The tax man cometh. Yeah. So do you either upgrade that tractor Yeah. so you don't pay as much in taxes which in turn supports jobs at John Deere or wherever you yeah. bought it from, or do you just eat the taxes and write the government a big old check and they piss it away yeah. in ten and, seconds, and, literally, yeah. and nothing? Yeah, hey, and you give weapons to the Afghans. Yeah, yeah, I, it, it's such a shitstorm on that, you know. And, and good tax preparation is very, very key in uh, yep. in making or breaking your farming operations. You know, you can't spend yourself rich. If there's something you need, you better find a way to get yeah. it and not just give all the money right. away because I, that doesn't work either. I fully believe that somebody our age, if you had to write a $100,000 check to the government, we're not established enough. There's something I think you could buy, unless somebody yeah. literally died and left you a line of nice machinery, Yeah, that you can help offset that little. If I'm 65 years old, everything's paid for, I got a tractor with 300 hours, and I'm like, well, I'm just going to trade because I want to pay taxes. Yeah. That didn't really gain you. You had a tractor, with basically a yeah. new tractor for another new tractor. That, yeah. I, I'm not going to do that. I would eat the taxes at that point and move on. Yeah, you know? but, yeah. Guys got to got to play the game a little bit. And, but that's any any small business, even any large business is doing. Oh, for that, sure. Yeah, you know? I don't matter I mean, if you're construction. They're all or, doing. That. I mean, farmers yeah. catch hell for it. But I mean, the CEO of Pfizer's debating on whether or not sure. they trade planes for the same reason. Yeah, exactly. You know. Yep. So. And and I think the average American doesn't realize the other industries that are subsidized. You know, farmers yeah. always get the black eye because there are subsidies in farming. Yeah. You know, some years more there's, than others. There's plenty of subsidies in other industries. Too. Exactly. They yeah. always overlook that. But. Yeah. Subsidies or nod, nod, wink, wink, government contracts. Yeah. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just seen today that uh, Chuck Grassley is running again. And I thought it said by the end of his term he will be 95 nice so you know he's very in touch with what's going on and i'm sure there's people going to be on here that oh well you know he has done a lot for the american farmer well i can tell you this much right now chuck grassley has done more for chuck grassley's wallet than he's done for you or i (laughs) yeah i will assure you of that yeah that's for sure because when you're that age with that kind of money don't you think it'd be time to step back and enjoy the grandkids and maybe live life a little bit i mean what what other job on the planet do you work until you are literally 100 years old? You remember Strom Thurmond, yeah. the senator, was yeah. in a fucking wheelchair, yeah. wheeling him down the aisle? I mean, do you yeah. know other guys that are in factories that are just, people yeah, just push them in, in wheelchairs and everything? Dying to go, yeah. 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 Doesn't yeah. work it's that just way. power. Mm-hmm. Comes down to power. Yeah. So, don't blow smoke up my ass. That's, uh... <laughs> yeah, that's for him. It ain't for us. Yeah. It's sad, but what are you going to do about it? It's here to stay, and it is what it is, but... But moving along from the senators, whatever, and all this kind of shifting gears here, what do you think your grandpa would say if he could come back and know that there's farmers in America making as much money off of a YouTube channel showing how they farm as what they do farming? I I think they'd be pretty perplexed with that. Right. Yeah. (laughs) It's crazy to think about stuff that you and I take for granted that don't think twice about doing that you can film yourself doing yeah and make an actual living yeah off of doing it and and it's frustrating for me to think that it's gotten to that point where like being able to do it isn't as valuable as being able to film it 
Yeah, being able to show that you can. Yeah, it, yeah, you can do parts of it. I mean, you you can edit out the bad parts. Yeah, you know, so uh, making something with your, with your hands isn't as valuable as filming something right. that you quote unquote made with your hands. Yeah, in this day and age, and it uh, there's a lot of people that really don't make, produce, or build anything. They're making very good living and not knocking them for it. Hats off to them. Yeah, I wish I would have figured it out before they did. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And it takes a certain demeanor to go down that path even. But, uh, yeah, good for them. But, uh, yeah, it's it'd be very interesting to see their take on it. Of course, there's so much stuff, the technology side of things, that they would be so mesmerized by. Oh, yeah. I mean, they were lucky to have a color TV, you know, for however long. And now there's a TV, you know, at the gas pump. Yeah. So, it, it uh, I think they'd struggle with it a little bit. It would be shelter shock, shell shock for sure. Yeah, that would definitely be getting the comments of you young guys mm-hmm. and don't know how to mm-hmm. <laughs> work or whatever you want to throw in there. Yeah, but yeah, it would be it would be mind boggling if you could just bring somebody back that died in 1979. Well, you remember those old movies, and I can't think of the name of one off the top of my head, but you know, there's some time travel involved or whatever, and there's all the stuff that's changed. You know, or whatever, like the one with Sylvester Stallone, I can't think, Demolition Man or whatever it was, you know. I never knew, figure out the three seashells thing, but, you know, the stuff that changed in that, which some of that's come to fruition to a sure. certain degree. You know, we're, we've seen some of that now. It's like, yeah, it just, I don't know that your mind can handle it. You know, right. a little bit at a time, you can ingest it a little bit, but to see it all at once, one fell swoop, if you move from 1970 to yeah. 2020, they, I, I don't know, it'd probably blow your mind. They would be more shocked to come from 1970 to now than if you dropped you or I in 1850. Yes. By yeah. a landslide. Yeah. You know. Yeah, for sure. It's just nuts. But I always remember, you know, growing up in school, they always told us, you know, of course, there was no cell phones, nothing. I'm talking we was in like second or third grade. And I remember teachers telling us back then that someday you'll be able to pick up the phone and see the person yeah. that you're talking to, you know. Yeah. And it, it sounded weird at the time, but... it. They were spot on. I don't know. Every time I bump that button on my phone, it tells me this person can't accept, cannot accept video calls. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but you're right, you know. Of course, by the same token, they always tell you, well, you got to learn this. You're not going to have a calculator with you all the time. The joke's on you. Exactly. I do have one all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing how cell phones, when they first come out, was so handy. Because now, man, I can talk to anybody, you know, if yeah. I have car trouble, whatever. To where it's went so far now that it's become a burden. It's like, man, you just soon burn this thing. Yeah, and, and you get so reliant on it. Like the calculator thing. The other night I was at the concession stand. And, and it was a young girl. But my total for my goods was 250 I gave her a 5 She turned to the other girl. She's like, he gave me a 5 His bill's 250 What do I give him back in change? Right. And I'm like, 250 yeah. And she looked at me like I was cross-eyed. Right. And, you that's know. what you get. That's what you owed me. You know, I don't, you get, yeah. She looked at the other girl. And she's like, she just nodded, looked at me and laughed because she was a few years older than, than this. Other. And this, this girl was not super old, you right. know? So, but it's still, it's like, that's fairly basic math. I'm right. like five minus two fifty. I'm like, we're not, t- I didn't ask you to do like right. any sort of calculus in there. <laughs> But, you know, we're to that point, you get relying on it, you know, and and it does dumb you down on some level. And I'm as guilty as anybody, you know, auto oh, steer yeah. quits on a tractor. I mean, yeah. I, I can still do it, don't get me wrong, that's how we grew up, but it's like, man, you don't want to. I mean, <laughs> My brother always jokes that auto steer failure is not an emergency in the in the service world, you know. <laughs> and, and he's right, it's not. He's not. I, I got a friend, he's like, he's a tech, and he's like, you know, guys will call him, hey, I got this auto steer problem, da 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 you know, I'm down or whatever. He's like, what you're going to want to do is look in front of you. There's this round black thing. If you turn it, that tractor will drive. <laughs> yeah. You're going to have to do that till I can get there. Oh, yeah. I, how soon do you think you're going to be here? I, I, I got some things I could do. I'll just park for a little bit. You know, uh-huh. It's like, and I'm, you know, I always used to joke that it was the air conditioner, right? Like, yeah. the air conditioner quits. That's crisis lockdown. Like, wheels right. can be falling off of it. Right. We haven't had the hoods on for three years. Air filter's right. laying in the shop. Yeah. But if the air conditioner quits, bam, yeah. we're done. Exactly. Now it's the auto steer, you know. Yeah. Which, Which some of that stuff, I always say they ought to tie into the air conditioner and the auto steer. Exactly. It's like, hey, you're low on oil. I don't need an alarm for that. Just kill the air right. conditioner and the auto steer. That guy's stopping right. for sure. Exactly. <laughs> Which, now... 
you hell, I had to call you during planting double crop beans because it is a crisis. When you can't open the windows. <laughs> you, you can't, can't open the windows. You're just but done. Yeah. You are in a greenhouse. I mean, yeah. it's like you look like a drowned rat when I got out there, and you hadn't been in there that long. It's exactly. like, yeah, but I feel your pain on that. But air conditioner quits, so do I. Yeah, if you had told my grandpa that, you know, you got to quit with the air conditioner quits. I mean, it looked that way. Like you had two heads. Yeah. Like, what are you talking about? Well, for starters, if you do open the windows in any of my tractors, I'm going to be pretty upset. Yeah. That's most a, of them don't open anyway now. But Yeah, a little different animal. You don't just kick the door open and say, well, we'll just run it today until we can get it fixed. No. Nope, don't work that way. So No, that uh, guy didn't realize how, you know, you can knock the 1086 cab all you want, but those were the best windows. If you needed to breeze, you pop them out, and they would scoop a little air in. Like, you could get a little, of course, the air conditioner's going to quit in that. Right. So you could scoop a little air in, you know. <laughs> and you sure weren't going to open the suicide doors. It was going to blow shut as soon as you open. It blow shut, yeah. <laughs> Now, Heston was ahead of their time. You could latch those doors like four inches open. Oh, really? Little rods that flipped out so you could scoop the air in on those. No kidding. And then the, the side windows opened up and the back one, of course. I'll be dang. Now, they were ahead of their time on that. You could latch the windows or the doors open like four or really? six inches or whatever. Yeah. I'll be damned. And they, and they, I mean, it didn't rattle or anything. There was a little deal. You screwed it tight. Nope. So, so it, it, held it would hold them in really? that position. Now, I can assure you, those have never been used on mine. If you ever thought about doing that, my dad was not going to be very happy with you. Like, you didn't even open the back glass to back up to the implement because dirt was going to fall on the cab, uh-huh. and he's going to be unhappy about that. But <laughs> yeah. I had to come down after harvest and do it, a tour of the Heston yeah, on my YouTube channel. Yeah. I was surprised how many people didn't realize Heston yeah, made tractors. Yeah, there wasn't very many. <laughs> you know, I'm a Steiger guy through and through, but air conditioner quits on 9370. You got nothing. Exactly. There's not a window. The only window in that thing that opens, unzips, and falls out for emergency use only. Yeah. <laughs> you're only opening that one time, and you're yeah. going to call somebody. You, otherwise, you're going to ride with the, holding the handle of the door, trying to scoop a little air in. Mm-hmm. And if you're going the wrong way with the breeze, you got yeah. nothing. Not going to work. Yeah. Nope. Nope. That's for sure. I don't know. <laughs> well, what do you think? Cut her off here. I think we've about yeah, went full we, circle again. Yeah, we've wrapped her so, up. Well. We thank everybody for tuning in. Hopefully, this will get you a few more passes through the field listening yeah. to the podcast. Everybody getting a little bitchy because we hadn't made yeah, any, but we yeah. just ain't had time. <laughs> just ain't had time. But, hell, I'm glad people want to hear it, I guess. Yeah, no it doubt. Could be the other way. They could be telling us to shut it off. So. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so, But, nope, we thank you guys for tuning in. And, uh, yeah, keep it tuned right here. We'll try to get as many of these cranked out as we can through Harvest here, but you got to bear with us a little bit. So, with that being said, we will see you guys next time. Thanks for tuning in, guys. We'll see you.